what would the internet be if we couldn't use it to speak freely? Um, I'm afraid that that's a freedom that you and I might be taking for granted. Um, there's a piece of legislation from 1996 called Section 230 that made the internet the free place that it is today. But as concerns about online censorship are growing, there are key figures on both sides of the aisle that are talking about repealing it. This may sound like a very political or fine print kind of issue, but I want to assure you that this affects you, me, and anyone who uses or cares about the internet. I got really interested in this piece of legislation, and after spending a long time in some complicated legal journals, I want to explain why we should not repeal Section 230. I believe that it could destroy the internet as we know it, that the principle behind doing so would be unconstitutional, and that there's no better alternative being offered to replace it. So first of all, it could destroy the internet as we know it. When I say the internet as we know it, I'm talking about a safe home for free speech. Without Section 230 being passed, the internet likely would have never been a safe home for free speech. This piece of legislation says that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. And that may sound like gibberish. Even legal scholars will agree that this is vaguely worded, but it's essentially the First Amendment of the internet. The cybersecurity law professor at the Naval Academy named Jeff Kosef wrote a book about Section 230 calling it the 26 words that created the internet. In the Journal of Technology, Law, and Policy, he broke it down in two parts. First of all, websites like Facebook and Twitter aren't legally accountable for what third parties, users, people like you and me, say and do on them. So if I say something stupid on Twitter, Twitter's not going to get in trouble. I will. Secondly, websites can have the freedom to control and moderate their platforms as they see fit. There's free speech value in letting websites determine content standards for themselves. These two things are really big deals. As Benjamin Volpe explains in an article for Catholic University Law Review, courts used to hold websites strictly responsible for what third parties use them for. It's only because Section 230 took that fear of being liable away that they could actually encourage interaction with users. Fast forward to today, and it's impossible to imagine the internet without third party or user generated content, posts, tweets, pictures, reviews, comments. Without Section 230, websites would have maybe never felt safe allowing these things at all. If we were to take Section 230 away entirely, free speech would be significantly limited through what's called the collateral censorship. Collateral censorship. As Eric Goldman explained it in the Notre Dame Law Review, it's when all content isn't allowed to eliminate even the possibility of borderline or inappropriate content so a company can protect itself against being liable. Think about how much that would upend the business models of websites like Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, anyone who's depending on user-generated content, not to mention the startups that don't have the big tech resources that these companies have. They wouldn't feel safe letting their users speak freely because Legally speaking, they wouldn't be. Taking away Section 230 would really change how you and I are allowed to use the internet. However, there's a more serious legal issue at play than just what this would do to the internet. Repealing Section 230 wouldn't be constitutional. In fact, the Harvard Law Review published an article in 2018 explaining why. To understand the constitutional issue, let's look back at the case of Smith versus California from 1959. So, a bookstore owner was arrested because there was a book in the store that was deemed inappropriate. However, the court decided that he couldn't be fairly held responsible for what someone else wrote just because the book was in his store. The court said that legal devices and doctrines in most applications consistent with the Constitution cannot be applied in settings where they have the collateral effect of inhibiting the freedom of expression by making the individual more reluctant to exercise it. So let me break that down. Essentially. If the bookstore owner could only sell books that he had read, there would be very few books that were available to the public. And the First Amendment rights to freedom of expression and freedom of press would be severely limited. The court recognizes that there's danger in holding the middleman responsible if it makes him more reluctant to exercise his constitutional rights. The same principle applies to Section 230. The internet is just a bigger bookstore. Just like we need bookstores to get books to people, we need the internet to get information to people. 
but just as it's hard for a bookstore owner to know what's in every single book before selling it, it's a lot harder for websites to know what's in every post before making it available. The answer for California, though, wasn't to take immunity away from bookstores. The answer for us can't be to take it away from websites. If it wasn't enough to know that repealing these protections would be constitutional, we also have to remember that there are serious flaws with the other ideas on the table. To put it simply, there's no better alternative being presented. The reason that Section 230 has opponents, the, the problem people have with it, is they don't believe that websites are stewarding their freedom well when it comes to the issue of censorship. Think about recent controversies with uh, Facebook and fake news. However, I think a lot of these opponents are failing to account for just how hard content moderation actually is. Any proposal to have people screen content fail to account for the sheer magnitude of what's posted online every day. It would be expensive, inefficient, and just unrealistic to expect people to sort through hundreds of millions of posts, and websites would still be accountable for their mistakes, which are easy to make. Some opponents have argued that uh, websites must act as unbiased or neutral platforms to receive Section 230 protections. Uh, a 2010 article about badging from the Harvard Law Review points out that that's not only not how we protect free speech, but how's the government going to mandate neutrality? How can we expect companies to remove any bias from an issue as subjective as censorship? Finally, we have to remember that any government-censored options for the internet are slippery slopes. The framers of the Constitution built our country on the freedoms of press and expression because they saw firsthand what happens when the government suppresses the voices of the people in the places that it matters. We would be remiss to forget that importance when we're talking about a platform that unites all Americans like none ever has. I hope you can see the problems with simply throwing away Section 230 that it would change the internet to be a very different and significantly less free place, that it would not abide by previous constitutional rulings, and that there's really no better alternative being offered to us. I think it would alarm us if our leaders were talking about throwing away the First Amendment because they didn't like how we were using it. But why should it be any different with Section 230? Yes, there's a lot of garbage on the internet, but taking away Section 230 wouldn't just take away the garbage, it would take away the free speech as well.